delighted to have with us today Dr. Laura Khan, and she will be sharing some fascinating findings from her research for the book One Health and the Politics of Coronavirus. Um, this is actually the seventh event that is being hosted by the Our Ladies Rome chapter. My name is Katie Wood. I'm one of the chapter's organizers and uh, Federica Gazzalone, who's with us also, um, she is the, the main organizer of these events. And um, just a note in Italian here for, the, for our Italian uh, ladies who have joined us, benvenuti. Questo è il settimo evento per Our Ladies Rome. Io sono Katie Wood, una delle organizzatrici con Federica Gazzaloni. Oggi siamo in compagnia della dottoressa Laura Kahn, che ci parlerà del suo ultimo libro. Tutto il materiale e la registrazione di questo evento verranno condivisi su GitHub, Twitter, YouTube e sul nostro sito. Uh, for those of you who may not know much about Our Ladies, Our Ladies is a global organization with the mission of promoting the R language and for empowering women at all user levels by building a collaborative global network. It was founded in 2012 by Gabriela de Queliros in San Francisco, and it is a gender diversity friendly community. Uh, today, it boasts 218 chapters in 29 countries and a staggering 93,000 members globally, which is fantastic. And you can find out more about the ourladies.org uh, at this address here. Some of the, I mean, Our Ladies is quite a recent um, setup. It's a local ch chapter of the Our Ladies Global, and it's, uh, I think it began at the beginning of this year or maybe the end of last year. Um, we have monthly meetings providing a platform to be able to discuss current trends and hot topics in R. And we do encourage active participation, participation and engagement from all of our attendees. Um, the founder of the chapter is Claudia Vitola, and she's also a co-founder of Our Ladies Global. And as I said, uh, Federica and myself, we are the organizers here locally. We are always open to uh, new joiners. So if you'd like to contribute to our own chapter or if you'd like to help uh, become a co-organizer, do let us know at uh, rome at ourladies.org. Some of the events that uh, happened in 2013, uh, as you see, it's a, we have monthly events, January, February, March. Uh, we've had uh, modeling, infectious diseases, why I hate summertime, <laughs> data science, uh, best practices. And of course, today we have um, One Health and the Politics of Coronavirus. As we said, Laura Khan is joining us. In the second half of 2023, we'll be doing a kickstart for um, our late, for our people who want to learn more about uh, coding, who maybe don't have much, much experience. So watch this space. We'll be sending you more information about this um, when available. Won't be long. So today's presentation, uh, Dr. Laura Khan, for those of you who don't know her, she is incredibly a physician, an author, and an educator who has dedicated almost two decades to the program on science and global security at Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs. Wow. Um, she's not only transforming the way we approach public health crisis, which is <laughs> very topical, but has also launched a global initiative, the One Health Initiative, that you may have heard of if you've done a little bit of research um, on her. Her visionary 2006 publication, Confronting Zoonosis, Linking Human and Veterinary Med Medicine, in the CD. Uh, in the CDC journal Emerging Infectious Diseases, set the stage for this revolutionary movement that recognizes the interconnectivity between human, animal, plant, environmental, and ecosystem health. 
And I'm sure she'll be telling you a little bit more about that in today's um, talk. Her most um, recent adventure, a Coursera uh, course title, is Bats, Ducks and Pandemics, an introduction to One Health policy, which has attracted thousands of students worldwide. And her efforts have also earned her numerous awards, including the prestigious K. F. Myers James H. Steele Goldhead Cane Award. Wow, that's a real mouthful. Um, from the American Veterinary Epidemi Epidemiology Society. Um, she's already got two belts books under her belt, including Who's in Charge? Be a new book coming out, uh, One Health and Coronaviruses was be coming out soon, and there is no doubt that Dr. Khan's groundbreaking work, groundbreaking work will continue to have a lasting impact on global health for years to come. So with that very prestigious introduction, I will pass the uh, ball here to Dr. Khan. And she can tell us more um, about all these wonderful um, things that I've just spoken about. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. I'm going to share my screen. Yes. And um, let me know if you can see it. Uh, That's perfect. Perfect. I want to acknowledge all my veterinarian colleagues in the audience. They've been playing <laughs> a seminal role in the... Uh, uh, the uh, dissemination of One Health. Uh, they've been working on it for decades. So um, I'm going to give you a, a snapshot, if you will, of the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus research, uh, the history and the science, a One Health analysis of the pandemic. Um, this is a, a excerpt from my book, if you will, kind of a short synopsis. So um, uh, let's begin. Uh, just a brief um, over, overview of One Health, the concept that human, animal, plant, environmental, and ecosystem health are linked. Uh, and this concept provides a useful framework for examining complex subjects such as pandemics. And if we're to develop effective policies to mitigate or prevent pandemics, we need to look at the root causes, which One Health allows us to do. Uh, and I think it's important that we recognize that we interact with our environment every day by inhaling air, drinking water, and ingesting the plants and animals that we call food. And uh, I can't go outside today because the air is too polluted from the wildfires from Canada. So that's how much the environment impacts uh, our health and well being. Just want to point out the One Health Initiative website that my colleagues and I. Uh, administer uh, since 2008. So please visit it and tell your friends and colleagues to visit it as well. There's many ways to visualize the One Health concept. Uh, you have often intersecting circles, uh, either coordination, communication, collaboration, humans, animals, or the environment, or you can divide it according to animals, wildlife, uh, or domestic or humans. Uh, we have the umbrella graphic with uh, lots of uh, zoonotic diseases or comparative medicine. Uh, for me, I find a, uh, a uh, Rubik's cube to be useful when, um, when using it as a framework. And I indeed used a Rubik's cube as the framework for my book. So I used one health factors along one uh, dimension, humans and animals, plants, environments, and ecosystems complexities factors along the other dimension, looking at microbial cellular individual and population levels, giving you a sense of scale, uh, the political, social, and economic factors, which can be divided by uh, political borders at the local, regional, national, and international global. And you can also use another dimension time, which I don't have visualized here. You can squish the cube down into two dimensions and you can see the intersections then uh, of these different, um, uh, of, of the matrix. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to give four little mini analyses. Um, the One Health factors looking at animals, domesticated and wild. 
The second is humans, the third is environments, and the fourth is the political, social, and economic factors looking at biosafety, biosecurity, and bioethics. So let's move on to our first One Health analysis looking at the animals. And just to give you a quick take home message of this, uh, it's important to recognize that coronavirus epidemics or epizootics, if you will, have been domesticated food animals since the 1930s. Most transmission has been fecal oral, but aerosolation is possible. Uh, a take home message, natural spillover data, i.e. animal antibodies and antibodies from occupational exposures exist for SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, but not for SARS-CoV-2. So let me move on. So the first outbreak was identified in the U.S. Midwest in 1931. Uh, it's called avian infectious bronchitis, the first recognized coronavirus outbreak. Uh, since then, this virus has had global distribution, high mortality in chicks, spread by fecal oral secretions, respiratory secretions, and possibly aerosol uh, transmission. The next, and there's been many, and I'm just giving you the highlights, if you will. Uh, porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, a great name, um, emerged in the UK in 1971, 90 to 95% mortality in piglets, explosive fecal oral transmission. Uh, in 2010, there was an outbreak in China, over 10 provinces and 1 million piglets died. And interestingly, three years later, the virus appeared in Iowa. Uh, swine farmers, uh, they identified the strain 99% identical to the Chinese strain. So these coronaviruses get around. Um, in um, 2016, the swine acute diarrhea syndrome, also known as porcine enteric alpha coronavirus, is the fifth porcine coronavirus identified. And interestingly, uh, scientists identified that it uh, emerged from the HKU2 bat coronavirus in China. Uh, again, explosive fecal oral spread. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, coronaviruses um, uh, can infect across many different species, including humans. Uh, the bats uh, appear to be the, uh, the main reservoir. Um, when you divide them up into different genuses, there's the alpha coronavirus, and there's a history with this that I discuss in my book, but I won't here for the sake of time. Beta coronavirus subgenus, uh, the SARS and SARS-CoV-2 are in the Sarbacovirus lineage B, MERS is in the Merbicovirus, um, these are the viruses that infect humans, although never say never. There's the gamma coronavirus, and then there's delta coronavirus. And interestingly, uh, in 2021, uh, a strain of porcine delta coronavirus was identified in uh, sick Haitian children uh, in a routine screening of children. So. Um, Spillover events happen all the time, often invisibly, and um, we need to be aware that, uh, you know, in, in our developing policies to address these ongoing events. Now, in terms of evidence for natural spillover, there is uh, evidence for SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV. For SARS-CoV-1, there was animal antibody and viral genome evidence. Uh, viruses from palm civets in the animal market in the Guangdong province of China had genome sequences 99.8% identical to SARS-CoV-1. 80% of the palm civets tested positive for antibodies. And importantly, there was occupational antibody evidence. There was a study of 800 people in the Guangdong found that people who traded in mass palm civets had the highest positivity rate of 73% of IgG antibodies to SARS-CoV. If you look at MERS, substantial animal antibody evidence, dromedary camels throughout the Middle East and parts of Asia tested positive for MERS-CoV antibodies. And in fact, there were archived camel blood specimens dating back decades, um, positive for MERS-CoV antibodies. 
There was uh, also um, significant occupational antibody evidence. There was a study done in Saudi Arabia of over 10,000 adults from all 13 provinces found MERS-CoV antibodies in 0.15% of the samples. Um, in camel shepherds, antibody seropositivity rates were 15 times higher than the general population. And for slaughterhouse workers, they were 23 times higher than the general population. So uh, good evidence, good solid evidence of a natural spillover event. Now with uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, none of that is, uh, has been published. Neither the virus nor the antibodies to the virus have been identified in animals sampled in Wuhan. Liu et al. found zero out of 457 samples taken from 18 species of animals in the Wuhan market tested positive. And there is no human occupational data to the animals or higher seropositivity rates of infection, uh, seropositivity to the virus. Um, if that information is available, it has not been published, uh, at least not in the medical literature. By, and I did a deep dive in looking into all the surveys that were done by early 2020, because you had to do it early in order to see that signal. Chinese physicians had conducted serologic surveys of thousands of people to assess prevalence rate of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, but none of them included data on occupation, unfortunately. I would have liked to have seen occupational data in the workers, uh, and I would have liked to have seen occupational data in the laboratory workers, in the uh, animal market workers, and in the laboratory uh, workers. That would have answered a lot of questions, but that data is not available. So in terms of coronavirus spillover then, we have substantial data with SARS-CoV-1 from the bats to the mass palm smooths to humans, MERS-CoV from bats to dromedary camels to humans, SARS-CoV bats, we don't know, to humans. So that's where we are. And that brings us then to the question, well, did, was this a natural spillover of which there's no evidence? or from a laboratory acquired infection. And by, I mean no evidence, I mean no serologic evidence, which for me is the gold standard of what we have with SARS and MERS. So let's move on then to our next One Health analysis looking at humans. Um, and it's important to recognize that COVID-19, uh, the syndrome generated unusual disease characteristics in contrast to uh, SARS and MERS. And um, in fact, the uh, clinical manifestations of SARS in humans is so fast that I really liked this, um, this uh, article's title, The Four Horsemen of a Viral Apocalypse, the Pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2 Infection. Uh, and indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the uh, outside, outside weather. There are <clears throat> clinical similarities between SARS-MERS and SARS-CoV-2. For all three, the medium incubation period was five to six days. There are asymptomatic cases for all three. Initial symptoms were all vague uh, with uh, fever, cough, chills, fatigue, respiratory symptoms, cardiac, acute myocardial infarction was reported with all three. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea reported with all three, acute renal impairment, lymphopenia, and thrombocytopenia was reported for all three. Now, in contrast to that, the, there are substantial clinical differences between SARS-MERS and SARS-CoV-2. Only SARS-CoV-2 is reported to cause loss of smell and taste. Uh, only SARS-CoV-2 had many reports of dermatologic manifestations including erythematous rashes, vesicular lesions, urticarial lesions, and others. There was no dermatologic involvement with SARS-CoV-1 or MERS. Chronic sequelae, both SARS and MERS, have been reported to cause chronic fatigue, reduce pulmonary function, anxiety, and depression. But only SARS-CoV-2 was reported to have extensive reports of long-term effects called long COVID, uh, and, and a laundry list of uh, symptoms. 
The global case fatality rate for SARS was 9.6%, for MERS 34.5%, and for SARS-CoV-2, 2%. Fortunately, it was not at the level of SARS or MERS. Now, in terms of the loss of sense of smell and taste, Olfactory neurons do not express ACE2 receptors, but olfactory epithelium cells do. And those were the ones that were infected and caused this unusual symptom. In terms of the cutaneous manifestations, again, they were vast. And, uh, and in fact, there was even a, uh, an entity called COVID toe, uh, which uh, generated um, this unusual painful inflammation of the toes, um, which again, we did not see with SARS or MERS. Uh, in terms of long COVID, there've been many reports now. Uh, one was a systematic review, 18,000 publications screened, 55 long-term effects estimated. And in that, again, many, many symptoms and some signs of the effects of long COVID. And for the sake of time, I'm not gonna get into all of them. There've been many uh, proposed contributing mechanisms to long COVID. Uh, again, I'm not gonna get into that for the sake of time. Um, there is some evidence that the, that the vaccine provides some protective effect against developing long COVID and uh, NIH has been invest, investing over a billion to investigate long COVID. So there are studies ongoing on that. Let's now move to the third One Health analysis looking at the environment um, at the microbial cellular levels. SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV were primarily transmitted by respiratory droplets, SARS-CoV-2 primarily by airborne transmission. So uh, it's important to recognize what R0 is. R0 is the number of people that one infected person will infect. And the goal is to get, uh, the public health goal is to get R0 to be less than one so that the uh, epidemic or the outbreak will uh, burn out, that you don't have enough susceptible people to continue the chain reaction. So the estimated R0 for SARS-CoV-1 ranged from 1.7 to 3.6, meaning that one sick person will on average infect 1.7 to 3.6 other people. For MERS, that ranged from 0 0.45 to 8, uh, depending on the, uh, the setting. SARS-CoV-2, the original variant, 2.5 to 6.1 people. The Delta variant, the mean was five. And for the Omicron variant, uh, the R0 has ranged anywhere from three to 9.4. Although there was one report of a R0 of 24 in South Africa. How accurate that is, uh, I don't know. Primary mode of spread for uh, both SARS and MERS was um, respiratory droplets. For um, SARS-CoV-2 and its variants, uh, primary spread is um, uh, airborne transmission. However, it's important to note that um, airborne transmission was possible uh, for, um, for all of them. And uh, the virus uh, is excreted in um, both urine and feces, and so wastewater detection is possible for all of them. And indeed, uh, CDC established a national wastewater surveillance system that provides early, warnings, uh, early warning of viral spread, which has been quite useful for uh, epidemio epidemiologic surveillance. And of course, indoor air quality is important. Uh, monitoring indoor air quality, if anything, this pandemic has shown us the importance of quality indoor air. Uh, because without it, uh, you do get uh, disease transmission. So that then brings me to the fourth One Health analysis, looking at the political, social, economic factors, biosafety, biosecurity, bioethics. Um, fur and cleavage sites have been inserted into the spike proteins of SARS-CoV-1 since 2005. 
the fern cleavage site in SARS-CoV-2 is suggestive but not conclusive that it was from laboratory uh, insertion. Um, in terms of biosafety levels, you can have the open bench to the uh, spacesuits and the enclosed uh, laboratories. Um, recommendations are that SARS be done at biosafety level, uh, level three uh, conditions. However, there's, um, there were reports that uh, the research on SARS in the Wuhan uh, labs were done in biosafety level two labs. Um, and uh, in this one uh, MIT technology review, again, uh, in the US uh, work on SARS was done in biosafety level three and in China biosafety level two. Uh, and again, there were other reports in science as well that the work was done in a uh, less contained environment. In terms of biosecurity and bioethics, uh, back in 2004, the National Research Council published uh, this report, Biotechnology Research in an Age of Terrorism, and it outlined seven experiments of concern. Those seven experiments of concern that should not be done to show how to render a vaccine ineffective, confer resistance to therapeutically useful antibiotics or antivirals, enhance the virulence of a pathogen or make a non-pathogen virulent, increase the transmissibility of a pathogen, alter the host range of a pathogen, enable evasion of diagnostic or detection modalities, or enable the weaponization of a biological agent or toxin. Now, you could argue that um, there's, there's a term called uh, dual-use research of concern. Uh, Basically, most uh, research on pandemic potential pathogens could be listed as dual use, depending on what you're doing with it. Uh, the only difference is what you plan to do with it. So um, the NIH defined gain of function research to improve the ability of a pathogen to cause disease. So one could argue then that this does fit the seven experiments of concern to enable uh, or the weaponization of a pathogen to make it more virulent. Uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, again, virologists have been inserting fern cleavage sites into SARS spike protein since two 2005. I list uh, several of these papers here. They do not mention the biosafety levels of the laboratories in the method section. At least I couldn't find it. So in terms of a comparison then of the viruses uh, of SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS, the uh, binding site is the ACE2 receptor. For MERS, it's the DPP4 receptor, and that's a mouthful, and I'm not going to try to uh, 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 um, uh, spell it out. Uh, and again, the ACE2 receptor for uh, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1 does not have a fern cleavage site. MERS has two fern cleavage sites, one at the S1, S2 junction in the spike protein and the S2 prime junction. SARS-CoV-2 has a fern cleavage site at the S1, S2 junction. So just to um, highlight uh, how unusual SARS-CoV-2's uh, fern cleavage site is, it really is kind of a red herring in the list of the sarbacoviruses. None of the other sarbacoviruses have a fern cleavage site, uh, although it's been well pointed out that other uh, coronaviruses do indeed have fern cleavage sites. So a, a brief then recap of uh, the analysis that we've done. Uh, Coronavirus epidemics have been occurring in domesticated food animals at least since the early 1930s. Most transmission has been fecal oral, but aerosolization is possible. Natural spillover uh, data, i.e. animal antibodies and antibodies from occupational exposures exist for SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, but not for SARS-CoV-2. 
COVID-19 generates unusual disease characteristics, including loss of taste and smell, widespread dermatologic manifestations, and long COVID that we did not see with SARS or MERS. SARS, CoV-1, and MERS primarily transmitted by respiratory droplets, SARS-CoV-2 primarily by airborne transmission. Fur and cleavage sites have been inserted into spike proteins in SARS-CoV-1 since 2005. The fern cleavage site in SARS-CoV-2 is suggestive but not conclusive to be of laboratory origin. Uh, it's important to recognize that in 2017, the NIH lifted a three-year ban on funding risky virus studies, gain-of-function studies. So the question is now, where do we go from here? Uh, according to the World Health Organization, COVID has infected hundreds of millions of people, killed over 6 million people globally. In the US alone, over 81 million cases, over a million deaths. It behooves us to develop policies to reduce the risks of another pandemic happening soon. Since both origins are possible, either natural spillover or laboratory accident, um, we must examine and address all possibilities, particularly gain of function research since the evidence points in that direction. My colleagues and I in biosafety now are very concerned about um, the threat generated by spice, uh, risky research in laboratories. Um, one of the arguments for doing gain of function research is the ability to predict pandemics. And I argue in my paper, um, The Seven Deadly Sins of Biomedical Research, that that's a false argument. Uh, if you compare it to predicting hurricanes, uh, predicting hurricanes is a purely observational effort. Surveillance is done only. Uh, we do not seed clouds to see what causes a hurricane. We merely use satellite data, observational data, to see if one is forming. Similarly, we should not be uh, manipulating viruses to see what might set off a pandemic. That type of research is just too risky. So uh, we must learn to live sustainably on our microbial planet. Uh, One Health recognizes the interconnectedness of life. And the, uh, the matrix, uh, the analyses that we did revealed the connections between humans, animals, and environments. So what should we do? Societal challenges require political solutions. We absolutely must have a bipartisan inquiry into the pandemic's origins and public health responses. We must learn from our mistakes if we're to develop effective policies to prevent future catastrophes. And all scientific inquiries must be safe, secure, transparent, and ethical. Uh, and uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, my course, um, one Health course on Coursera, Bats, Ducks, and Pandemics, an introduction to One Health policy. Um, if you're interested in learning more about One Health, please visit it. I'd like to recognize my colleagues in the One Health initiative. And uh, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention. And I'm happy to take any questions or listen to your comments. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, what page? Thank you. Sorry, Federica, I'm having some issues here with my. Yeah technical issues here with coming in and out with the microphone. Um, that was fascinating. That was very, okay. very, very interesting. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Khan. Um, let's have a look. You please be welcome to put some questions in the in the chat. I've also put a link in there, where, which will go through to some anonymous questions. If you want to, to vote for them, please go ahead. 
Uh, let's have a look, see how we're doing for the moment with these questions. You just need to click on the link and you can vote the question. There we go. Okay. We've had a couple of people already looking at the question number one. What are the potential challenges in implementing effective One Health policies and initiatives on a global scale? That's vast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one of the challenges with One Health, I mean, the goal of One Health, if you will, is to break down barriers to increase communication, collaboration across the uh, species divide, if you will. Uh, and our institutions have been set up for over a century to build up those silos. So trying to break those silos down and, uh, and work <laughs> together is easier said than done. Uh, along with the funding streams, everybody says they want uh, interdisciplinary funding, but uh, we generally don't get interdisciplinary funding. So um, this field is in its infancy and uh, trying to to build up, uh, you know, those connections uh, is uh, is a challenge. It requires political will, it requires institutional buy-in, and it requires, most importantly, funding uh, that facilitate these connections to develop and grow. Yeah, I mean, we have the technology to do it today, don't we? That that's never going to be an issue from now on. <laughs> Now on, it's just, as you said, these other aspects that are the human aspects, <laughs> the decision making um, is obviously uh, a barrier to that. Uh, we have another question here. How does the One Health concept contribute to our understanding of emerging zoonotic diseases like cor coronaviruses? I think you kind of of answered that well i kind you? of answered that in my talk <laughs> yeah. that, you know they're zoonotic meaning that they come from animals so yeah. if you don't look at the source you'll never know what you're dealing with and you'll be right. constantly putting out fires so it's absolutely essential that we use a one health perspective to do surveillance of animals occupational surveillance of the people working with the animals to be prepared for any natural spillover or occupational surveillance of people working with these pathogens in the laboratory. That needs to be improved. There's not enough oversight. Yeah. But you mentioned previously that it was the, the funding and the politics. Would you say one is, is more, um, more important than the other or, or that do they sort of ride along the same road? Well, I mean, you need political support in order to get funding. So one depends on the other. They are dependent on each other. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look here. Um, how can international collaboration be improved to address global health crises such as a coronavirus pandemics more effectively. I think that sort of goes back to what you were saying, yeah. Right, well, I mean, there's the quadripartite that has formed between the World Health Organization, the World Organization of Animal Health, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the UN Environmental Program have all worked together to uh, recognize One Health and to develop strategies moving forward but uh, again that's at the international level it needs to be implemented at the national level and the regional level and that's where the rubber hits the road so um, it's one thing to say oh yes we need to do this but to actually implement it is a whole nother ball game yeah it's, it's a quite an interesting question um as individuals how can we contribute to the promotion and advancement of the One Health concept in our daily lives? Uh, well, you certainly want to help spread the word, learn about it, uh, educate uh, you know, your friends and family and colleagues about it and talk about it, write about it. Um, ideally, you know, help to promote it. Um, you know, part of the challenge is to get uh, public recognition of it. 
Uh, although I'm happy to say that I went to a, a meeting um, with some people who just do general policy a couple days ago, and they had heard of One Health. I was absolutely yeah. thrilled. Oh, I uh, bet. <laughs> when I mentioned the term, they said, oh, yeah, we're familiar with One Health. And I was just thrilled. Oh, I bet you are. <laughs> they had heard of it. So um, so the word's getting out, but it's certainly, um, you know, these were policy circles, uh, you know, in Washington, D.C. So um, we're, we're making progress, but we still have a long ways to go. Yeah. But as individuals, there's, there's not really anything that one can do individually, because at the end of the day, it's down to uh, um, decisions that are made through through politics, like you said. Is that right? Well, uh, you know, I have some colleagues who are school teachers and right. uh, one in particular, her son developed Bartonellosis, which is cat, cat scratch fever. Uh -huh. uh, and he was not diagnosed for years and was very ill. And she's become a One Health champion in Louisiana, um, getting, uh, you know, working to get One Health uh, into the yeah. school curriculum, um, getting political recognition of it. So there's a lot that people can do uh, yeah. if they're passionate about it. Um, I, something comes to mind regarding the carbon footprint, okay, as an analogy. So apparently the carbon footprint was invented by um, like a, mar a big marketing company. And it was sort of to put the onus on the individual of them actually, you know, the footprint is from a person. <laughs> it is their responsibility. And a lot of people try individually to, to make a difference. But at the end of the day, what makes the difference really is, you know, the policies and the rules and the laws that 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 sort of deal with the uh, emissions. You know, that's that, that's sort of right. Well, uh, you know, if enough of us gave up cars, <laughs> which is <laughs> um, easier said than done, given at least in the United States, our society is built around the car. Uh, and for in many areas, it's impossible to get around without a car. But if you're committed, um, you know, and you give up your car, and if enough people do it, then we could make a dent in uh, reducing <laughs> greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. Or if enough people stop eating uh, beef or, you know, ruminants, yeah. which are the largest uh, animal contributor to greenhouse to methane production um yeah. you know that can have a dent too so um so yeah so individually we can we can in your, yeah. right and you're purchasing decisions in your day-to-day -day life that you know if enough adds up it's easier um there's another question here how can we improve data sharing at the global level in a transparent and punctual way to streamline support and make effective investigations of zoonotic uh, pathogens. Well, uh, yeah, um, I mean, ideally you want to have animal surveillance and uh, it's hard enough to get public health surveillance of humans. I mean, there's lots of low to middle income countries, heck, even in the US where public health is, you know, barely, you know, barely gets funding uh, to get decent uh, epidemiologic surveillance of disease. Uh, it's even less so in animals, whether it's livestock or wildlife to do surveillance of, uh, of pathogens. And, and really, um, you know, if the pathogen is in wildlife and the wildlife aren't, you know, the wildlife isn't bothering anybody, just leave them alone. I mean, why, <laughs> why poke a hornet's nest? <laughs> you right. know, a hornet's nest, leave it alone. Don't start poking at it to see what might set it off. Um, that's <laughs> asking for problems. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, the time you start intervening is when it's causing problems, you know, before it gets worse. That's, yeah. that's kind of the strategy we should be doing. So if the livestock are getting sick or the humans are getting sick, um, you know, we want to identify it as soon as possible. But if the wildlife are doing their own thing and not bothering anybody, leave them alone. Don't eat them. Don't, yeah. uh, you know, or re at least reduce your consumption of them because particularly bats, um, because, uh, you know, 
there's a good chance they'll make you sick. Now, of course, you know, food security is a huge issue. Um, you know, it's easy for those of us who are food secure to say, well, don't eat that. But if that's all that's available to you, um, you know, yeah, absolutely. It's a challenge. So, you know, there's 8 billion humans on the planet. Everybody wants to eat. Everybody wants uh, proteins and needs proteins. So how we meet that in a sustainable way without unleashing more diseases is, uh, you know, one of the great challenges that we face moving forward. So um, we have to figure out how to, how to do it sustainably without unleashing more diseases upon ourselves. Federica, did you have a question in your hands there? Yeah. Um, so Dr. Khan, thank you very much. Hope you can hear me properly. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, connected yeah okay maybe there's a bit of delay uh my question is related with the art community uh if you had to commit a research which is uh, based on um, your uh, findings what what would be uh your um best advice so um what the art community interested in uh, improving uh, the One Earth Initiative research uh, can, can help, uh, can provide support uh, to you? Uh, you mean your research community? Well, I think um, the research community needs to be more transparent, uh, it needs to engage with the public, uh, it needs to insist on an open and honest investigation into the origin of this pandemic. Now, there's been some, some calls that, well, we don't need to know the origin of this pandemic. Well, if a plane crashed, uh, I don't think anybody wants to say, well, we don't need to know why the plane crashed. It crashed. So just leave it at that. Um, this is many, many plane crashes. Uh, I don't think anybody would wanna say, we don't need to know what caused it. That's not, that's not the way it should go. We need to know what caused it so we can prevent that from happening again. That's why I joined Biosafety Now, an organization dedicated to improving biosafety, biosecurity, and improved biorisk management. And many of us in that organization feel that the risks of gain of function research on pandemic potential pathogens, uh, the risks are out, far outweigh the benefits. Now, I don't wanna completely negate gain of function research because sometimes it's beneficial. For example, uh, to give harmless bacteria such as E. coli, the capability of producing insulin uh, for people with diabetes. That's a gain of function research that uh, is clearly beneficial with increased production of insulin. We need to continue that uh, to be able to provide uh, affordable uh, medications for many people. But to help mother nature kill us, that we should not be doing. And so many of us feel that this research should not be done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have any other questions from anybody? We've had loads of questions actually, so that's great. Oh, I got a question from Joan saying, why do you think public health won't say COVID-19 is airborne? This is a barrier to improving indoor air and in public spaces. That's a good question, Joan. I'm not sure why public health has been reluctant to say that the virus is airborne. Um, again, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Again, these are political decisions sometimes um, and it did the public a disservice. Great, any other questions from anybody? Um, so, I think we're, anybody else? No, we're pretty much good here. So 
unless there's any last minute questions, I think we can quite safely say thank you again to Dr. Khan. It was very, very interesting. And thank you for your time and all your slides. They're very helpful. Um,